Today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's time for a Jones Act debate. I'm your host, Sal Mercogliano. Welcome to today's episode. No, this isn't going to be a Jones Act debate between me and Peter Zion. I know how many of you have requested that. But this is actually a Jones Act debate over at the Center for Maritime Strategy. This is uh, a center that's supported by the U.S. Navy League. And specifically, this is on their Maritime Operations Center blog. And so they decided to bring in these two people and argue the pro and con of the Jones Act. If you don't know what the Jones Act is, this refers specifically to Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Now, the whole act is the Jones Act. But the part that usually gets mentioned is this section, which deals with cabotage. And what cabotage is, is the movement of good between two U.S. ports. But the requirement is to move goods between U.S. ports. You have to do it on a U.S. flagged, U.S. built, U.S. owned and U.S. crewed ship. This has been the rule since 1920. And prior to that, it was the rule since 1817. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, many nations have cabotage. But not all nations have the, the scope of the American cabotage. Some countries require, for example, just uh, have to be domestically flagged or the ships don't have to be built in their country. So there's different requirements for different countries. The U.S. cabotage is probably one of the most restrictive in the world. On the flip side, the U.S. is the largest economy in the world, has a massive overseas global presence in terms of economics and military. And so there's a lot of debates about why the U.S. should have the cabotage. We're going to look at this argument. We're going to break it down. We're going to look at the facts they use to support it. And then we're going to discuss. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and dive into the Jones Act. <laughs> okay, my, my evil laugh right there. So I'm great. I love this. I get to sit in the sidelines and referee between two people. So the two people involved here are John McCowan, who is a non-resident senior fellow for uh, the Center for Maritime Strategy. Strategy. I don't know why. I'm not a non-resident. I don't need to be senior. I can be junior. I'm a pretty young guy. Uh, fellow for the Center, but I'm not. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a fellow. Uh, so John will do it for the pro Jones Act side. And on the opposition side is Andrew Hale. Andrew Hale, coming down here, is the J. Van Andel Senior Trade Policy Analyst for the Heritage Foundation. Man, I, I wish I had a big, long title like that. I don't have anything like that. So let's look at what they say here in the introduction. I'm not going to read the article to you. I'm going to focus on the key points. But I really want to look at their, interest, their, their intro here. So Up for Debate is a project of the Center of Maritime Strategy geared towards driving thoughtful, energizing discussion about pressing issues facing the USC services and international maritime security. Our monthly series places two contrasting expert views into written conversation with each other about a timely issue of maritime significance. Okay. Fast forward here. In this edition, Mr. John McCowan uh, and Mr. Andrew Hale debate the following issue. Is Jones Act a help or hindrance to American shipping and national security? So very focused issue, not talking about the pro and con of the Jones Act in general, but looking at it as a help or a hindrance to American shipping and national security. So in the intro, John is unabashed that he is a supporter for the Jones Act and talks about the fact that the Jones Act has an economic cost that can be quantified. Some believe the cost is unacceptable. Most are influenced by what they understand that economic cost is, often informed by exaggerated figures and selective comparisons. Now, I should mention John was a former shipping guy. He, he knows the Jones Act. Critics like to highlight the vessel build cost multiple. The Cato Institute previously used six to eight times as the cost of building a ship in the U.S. compared to overseas, but now has settled on five times as their favorite exaggeration. And John provides a link to that specific story right here. America doesn't need more shipping protectionism. The Cato article is right there. So nobody's hiding sources here, which I like a lot. So he goes on here, actual comparables have it three times for tankers and four times for container ships. Building ships is labor intensive and the main product used in the construction is steel. U.S. wage rates are more than five times the rest of the world and its steel production accounts for 4.3% of world production. The majority of the world's steel is now made in China, the position the U.S. held until 1950. With the U.S. at a clear cost disadvantage with the two main factors used in building ships, there's no mystery why the cost costs more to build in the U.S. 
If you want to delve into that more, I recommend this podcast over here from Trade Talks, just dropped on November 5th, Industrial Policy Detectives, China's Subsidies for Shipbuilding from Harvard, explains a new technique she developed to overcome the challenges and reveal how much a Chinese industrial policy transformed the shipbuilding industry for the country and world. And you actually have a link to the article in the Review of Economic Studies. It's 74 pages. It's great. But if you don't want that much, listen to the listen to the podcast here the big issue that they come up with here is really five points number one that china provided land for almost no cost to china shipbuilders so there's almost no cost for the acquisition of land close to water second china had access to free capital almost loans and an unfettered amount of money to build a shipyard was provided to china uh, Chinese steel is cheap. It's subsidized. It's really cheap. Chinese labor is cheap and really subsidized. And therefore, all the in all the kind of big costs you have, land, capital, steel, resources, material, uh, personnel, are all cheap. And then you're basically operating in a fairly unregulated uh, industry where you don't have ASHA and labor laws and all those issues that the U.S. has to deal with. And understand, China builds 44% of the world shipping. The other 50%, 50 other percent is built in Korea and Japan. And Korea and Japan have to chase after China. So they have to drive down their costs to be comparable to China or else they're going to lose business to the Chinese shipyards, which has been happening over the past decade. So John makes a great point. Yes, U.S. is more expensive, but the real cost probably isn't that much more difference when you start factoring out all the issues of subsidies. Then John hits a lot of issues that really are the same, whether you're on a Jones Act ship or a foreign, act sh a foreign flag ship. So he talks about, for example, uh, crew costs is a lower multiple, but fuel and other ship-related costs, port costs, land costs, they're all the same. It doesn't matter if you're on a U.S. flag or a foreign flag ship. If you come into U.S. ports, you're going to be paying for the ports, paying for pilotage. All that stuff is going to be the same. In the container shipping, the large majority of carrier costs have nothing to do with the ship. Going through the real numbers, the total difference in an objective comparison for container shipping would be in the 15 to 20 percent range. In banging the anvil with a five times multiple, the critics are off by a factor of 25 to 33. Uh, he goes on here, with experience in the Jones Act as an operating investor, I've taken upon myself to challenge and correct mistakes I've seen by critics. In a May 21st article, he used the actual charter of a foreign flag tanker booked under the Jones Act waiver to show differences with 31%. In a July 21, uh, 2021 article, he dismantled a report saying the Jones Act cost Hawaii consumers $1.2 billion per year and pegged the real cost at $136 million. And one of the critics' way to spread Jones Act myths is equating it to gasoline costs. And in a July 2023 article, he took that claim that the Jones Act cost East Coast consumers $4.3 billion annually and unpacked it to show it cost about $85 million. And again, what I love is when I can link right to the articles, which you can through this article, and you can find these articles that John wrote on his Medium page where he has all three of those articles so that you can read the evidence for yourself. So he looks at this, the Jones Act cost differentials result from American laws, regulations, and labor practices. Any industry allowed to operate outside of these would see cost decline. And you know, this is the question I do have with those who want to waive the Jones Act. What exactly do you want to waive when you say the Jones Act? If you want to repeal the Jones Act, that means you remove all the restrictions. That means you can have foreign built, foreign flag, foreign owned, and foreign crewed ships operating in the US waters. Does that mean they can pay foreign wages? Or are they going to have to fall under U.S. labor laws? And before everybody sits there and says, well, of course, Sal, they would have to fall under U.S. labor laws. Ships that sail between American ports right now that are foreign flag don't pay their crew members more when they're in U.S. waters. So there are people in the U.S. earning less than minimum wage sailing ships in and out of harbors. Goes on here, any industry allowed to operate outside of these would see the crew of this cost decline. Jones Act ships are directly involved in domestic commerce and should be covered by the same rules governing other domestic industries. Further, it is incontrovertible that a U.S. flag merchant marine provides national security benefits as the only sea lift capacity in national emergencies. This is true. You know, one of the, the the facades you'll see used is they'll talk about the fact, well, in the Persian Gulf War of the 1990s, no Jones Act ships hauled cargo to the Far East. That's not what people say Jones Act tankers are going to do. 
they're not going to load cargo and sail to Saudi Arabia. But the reserve ships are going to be using Jones Act personnel who crew Jones Act vessels to crew the surge ships. And there are going to be Jones Act vessels hauling military cargo, for example, Matson and Pasha to uh, places like Hawaii and Alaska, which are forward staging bases for U.S. military forces. Goes on here, these trained seafarers are the key element in our merchant marine. Ending a significant portion of these jobs results in training issues not readily reactable. There is an extensive web of suppliers and professionals linked to the Jones Act that also provide critical products and services for naval shipbuilding. Harming them compromises that national security capability. The Jones Act makes sense for both equity and national security reasons. It would be reckless for Congress to repeal it, particularly today when the importance of stable service and seal of capacity in an emergency are more recognizable. I agree largely with John. However, I do think there needs to be reform. I, I think John is, is one of those guys who plants his flag on the mountain that is the Jones Act and doesn't like to budge. I do think there are areas that we need to be looking at. We need to do things better. Uh, it has caused problems in that the U.S. regulations have not kept up with international shipping and regulations. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the flip side of this argument. All right, so this is Andrew Hale from the Heritage Foundation. I don't know Andrew. I've never met him. I've never really seen anything from him, but they obviously got him to write this piece. Uh, the Jones Act is not working and has never delivered a competitive edge. All right, I disagree with that right off the bat. Uh, if you look at when cabotage was originally passed during the early Republic period of the United States, it did provide a huge competitive advantage. And even after its passage in 1920, it helped the United States. I, again, your example for that is World War Friggin II. You know, if you can't get it from the home front to the battlefront, it doesn't do you any good. And in many ways, the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 set that up, and it wasn't just cabotage. The U.S. has lost its global competitiveness in shipbuilding, no denying that, built less than 1% of the world's ships today. China, on the other hand, has constructed a premier merchant fleet while investing in more than 100 ports in 63 countries. Well, again, that's a huge amount of money. We talked about this. This is Belt and Road. Under the Jones Act, the U.S. Merchant Marine, pet peeve right here, do not capitalize Merchant Marine. Uh, it's not an entity or an organization. There's no U.S. Merchant Marine headquarters or anything like that. It is a, it is, it's like the U.S. Air Service or airlines. Uh, cannot compete with large Chinese co corporations such as Costco. Well, no, Costco is a Chinese overseas shipping company. It's owned by the Chinese government. It's hard for a private corporation with boards of directors and stockholders and having to make dividends to compete with a government corporation. Conversely, China's civil mill fusion, yeah, okay, let's talk a little bit more about civil military fusion, harmonizes, okay, harmonizes, seriously, harmonizes civilian shipping activity with military requirements. They don't harmonize it, they require it. I mean, they force it to happen. The Chinese are also not burdened with costly U.S. environmental labor and special interest regulations. Okay, I understand that we don't like environmental labor and, and, and um, uh, special interest regulations. However, there are certain elements that are pretty good, you know, the pollution, ASHA, uh, you know, child labor laws, minimum hours and wages. Those are all pretty good things. Uh, granted, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of overregulation, but there are some good ones. The Jones Act and ad valorem taxes on U.S. flag vessels for overseas ship maintenance have prevented the U.S. shipping industry from competing globally and hasten its decline. The Jones Act fleet has 257 ships in 1980 and only 93 ships today. Well, you're only counting ships over 1,000 gross tons. If you bring in uh, tugs and barges and offshore vessels and the Great Lakes fleet and the inland waterways and ferries and all that stuff, you get a lot more vessels. So they talk about this prevented U.S. shipping industry from competing globally. The link brings us to this article written by Colin Grabo over at Cato. Adam Smith would oppose the Jones Act. His next paragraph looks at the issue of maintenance. So Jones Act makes it expensive to maintain this fleet by requiring these ships to be U.S. built, even while the withering fleet size has reduced U.S. capacity. Well, this is a kind of a chicken and an egg argument. What is reducing the size of U.S. shipbuilding capacity? Is it because we're building less ships or do we have less capacity and therefore we're building less ships? And it's a little both. What's missing from this argument is the fact that it's not the Jones Act that has reduced the size of the U.S. merchant fleet. 
It's the fact that in the 1980s, we reduced the construction and operational differentials for ships in the international fleet. We used to subsidize those ships to compete against foreign flag vessels in international trade. When that went away, we stopped building commercial ships in U.S. shipyards to compete on the international trade, which meant that the few ships we're building for the coastal trade became more expensive because you're building less ships. It goes on here, the absurd consequence is that ships built in the U.S. now require maintenance in Ch Chinese yards. The absurdity is compounded by the fact that the 93 remaining aging U.S. ships would be limited military use in wartime. Okay, first off, there's a variety of things wrong with this statement, and let me clarify this. So he is citing an article, again, over by the Cato Institute by the same person, Colin Grabo, freaking Jones Act ships turn to Chinese shipyard for maintenance needs. Okay, why are they turning to Chinese shipyards? We got to ask yourself this question. Why is shipping companies on the West Coast of the United States turning to Chinese shipyards? And the answer is very clear. Number one, there's only a handful. I mean, and not even a handful. I mean, you count them on one hand the number of ship repair facilities on the West Coast, and those that can handle large deep draft vessels, even smaller. So for example, Vigor Shipyard up in Portland, Oregon is one of the big commercial yards that can do it. Uh, we're filming this on November 17th, 2023. This is the Vigor Shipyard from Marine Traffic right now. Uh, and what you'll see in here is six vessels are at the facility. The Pacific Tracker, the Golden Bear, although it's not squawking its AIS, but it is there uh, up in the dry dock right here is the John Lewis. This is the Cape Henry. This is the Pecos and Tanker 200 is the Guadalupe. Those are three ships owned by the Ready Reserve Force of the Maritime Administration, the Department of Transportation, and three MSC oilers of the Military Seal of Command of the Department of Navy. Six government owned ships are eating up all the repair capacity in Vigor. And not only are government ships eating up that repair capacity, but because the government owned ships, they're probably either getting in late, there's massive change orders, which means the time that the ships are going to be in the shipyard are going to be extended and off kilter, which makes it extremely difficult for a ship shipping line, like for example, Matson, which has a big robust fleet, to schedule time to do their repairs. Commercially, you want to bring your ship in on day one and get out on a set day. You want to be able to get it in because you have to get that ship out because the next day you may be loading cargo up in Puget Sound or Tacoma or Oakland or LA Long Beach. And so you need to make sure that if you book your ship into a shipyard, it's going to come in the day you book it and it's going to come out the day you require it and you're going to get the work done. The problem is because shipyards in the United States have become sole source customers or the Navy has become the sole source customer to shipyards. That means shipyards have become inefficient, slow, and they push their schedules back, which means that Matson to repair its ships or APL or Pasha or any U.S. shipping firm, whether it's Jones Act or not, has to go look for foreign shipyards. And when you go look for a foreign shipyard, you're going to pay a 50% ad valorem tax, which means you're going to look for the cheapest shipyard. You're also going to look for the shipyard that's going to be able to get you in and out on the time required, and that is China. Because China has the biggest repair facilities, the biggest shipyards right now. And because Matson, for example, services China, their ships are right there. They can literally go into China, offload their cargo, go into a shipyard, and they know they're going in day one and they're going to be out in day 30 if they have to. And that's why it's happening. It's not happening because Matson wants to go to China. It's because Matson can't get into U.S. shipyards because there's not enough U.S. shipyards to do it because we have curtailed the building of ships in the United States, both in the Navy and the international trade fleet, along with the Jones fleet. So you have to have the context to understand what Andrew is talking about. He goes on here and he talks about creating a wall of protection around the U.S. merchant fleet has not worked. The decline is in sharp, sharp contrast to China's fleet of 8,007 ships, the second largest in the world by carry, uh, cargo carrying tonnage. I have a problem with this. Some of the links in these, this article doesn't work for this side. I don't know why, but they don't. The 8,007 ships is a number he's pulling from the review of maritime transport. Number one, he's using the previous year's version, not the 2023 version. Second, if you look at that number, then the U.S. fleet's a lot bigger than 93 because it's counting all ships over 100 gross tons. When you look at that number from the 2022 chart that's in the review of marine tra uh, maritime transport from 2023, number one, 
first of all, Andrew is underselling the Chinese because I would add Hong Kong to that. And if you add Hong Kong to China fleet right here, you get 2,537 ships in Hong Kong. Add the Chinese fleet, 8,262. You're talking about almost 11,000 ships. But if you come down to the United States, 3,531. The most, the best way to do this is in terms of percentages. The U.S. controls 3.5% of the world's vessels by terms of numbers. If you go by deadweight capacity, it's only 0.6%. If you look at Hong Kong here and China, you're looking at roughly about 14, 15%, which puts it under Liberia and Panama as number three in the world. Again, I don't mind you using numbers, but make sure you use them accurately and correctly if you're going to make a point and don't skew them to emphasize your point. Because again, you're leaving everyone with the impression that we only have 93 ships and that China has 8,000 ships. Well, if you're going to use the measurement they use in the review of maritime transport, then be sure you sit there and say, we got 3,500. Now, the counter to that is someone's going to scream at me. He's like, oh, those are, those are barges. Those are barges they're using. Well, yeah. And barges are the efficient means to move cargo in the inland waterways. Because if you open up the Jones Act, they're going to replace them with barges. The barges are going to be what you use to come down the Mississippi, the Ohio, and the inland waterways. He then, to credit to him, Chinese shipbuilding benefit from $132 billion in direct subsidies as well as indirect subsidies and regulations between 2010 and 2018. Yet on the U.S. side, simply subsidizing a fleet that operates under the stifling Jones Act will not revive a declining U.S. merchant marine. And when you look at what he cites, he hits the Hidden Harbor report. This is CIS, a CSIS report, Hidden Harbor's Chinese state-backed shipping industry that highlights the fact that $132 billion in direct subsidies went to the Chinese shipbuilding from 2010 to 2018. In the same period for the U.S., Title 11 loans provided the U.S. shipbuilding industry with 77, not billion, but million dollars. And I, again, I come back to that argument, he says, that even with subsidies, you're not going to help the U.S. industry. Really? And again, this looks at direct subsidies. The podcast I cited earlier from Harvard University is talking about indirect subsidies. So the amount of money flowing into Chinese shipbuilding is astronomical. All right, then he has this. The U.S. government needs to encourage industry to leverage innovation technology. Perfectly agree. There, there's an inflection point in shipping right now, particularly with propulsion and what's going to be the new fuel due to IMO 2050 requirements coming down. The goal is to increase industrial capacity, yet U.S. regulators who implemented the Jones Act prevent new innovators from entering the market. I don't think that's true at all. General Steve Lyons, who was the commander of U.S. Central Command, has since been relieved by General Von Ovest, stated in a congressional testimony that it is 26 more times costly to build ships domestically in the U.S. than to purchase them from abroad. Okay, first off, I had a hard time finding that link that they're using, first off, because that comes up, so you can't get to the link. This is the statement given by General Lyons before this uh, House Armed Services Committee. He does not have that number specifically in front of him. Uh, I went to the Heritage Report, which we're gonna come back to, and I did not see that exact quote in here. It doesn't mean he didn't say it, I just don't have it linked to what he said. I will say that Andrew is, is wrong on this statement, even though he's quoting Lyons, because Lyons isn't correct in this statement now. The U.S. has bought five used ships on the open market to put into the sea lift fleet. Two of them were in the Maritime Security Program, their former uh, ARC, uh, American roll-on, roll roll-off carrier vessels. Each of those were purchased for $25 million. Uh, those ships have taken over a year to get reflagged into the U.S. fleet, even though they're already U.S. flagged. And then the three new ones they built, which are Messina line vessels, these are 10-year-old ships bought by an, from an Italian line, look a lot like the Cape H's in the uh, Ready Reserve Force. They were purchased for between 90 to $110 million. And it's going to cost an additional, on top of that, $20 million to reflag them. Those ships were more expensive to buy used than Messina line paid to buy them new. And there is no way, no way that... 110, 130 million dollars for the last one. Multiply that by 26 is what it would cost to build a, such a ship in the United States now. But 
This goes to the fact that Transcom and the U.S. government woefully, woefully underjudged how much it was going to cost to buy used sea lift ships. Because once the, the carriers saw them sniffing for used ships, the price went up. And that is clear from the cost that Messina Lines charged the U.S. to buy the three ships, which are going to become the Cape S-Class in the Ready Reserve Force. It goes on here. It's just a question of labor costs, although Chinese labor is becoming less inexpensive. Okay. I, I don't think they're making U.S. minimum wage anywhere close. Even if lower Chinese labor costs are removed from the assessment, U.S. regulations and restrictions still make American shipping 18 times more expensive. And that is from the Heritage Report where he goes into it. I'm going to come back to this again. He goes on here, the vast majority of the differential only arose after the J Jones Act created a protective wall that stifled competitive forces for U.S. shipbuilding. That's not true. Can be clear, I, I mean, if you look at the studies for the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, in the, the Senate hearings, they talk about the fact that U.S. shipping shipbuilding is more expensive than, than British. They, they have that number in there. They show it. They talk about it for a fact that that has been an issue because the British don't have the same laws for their people that the U.S. has. It's just more expensive. And so to blame this all on the Jones Act, this is the biggest problem I have with a lot of people who attack the Jones Act. They believe it's the cause for all the problems in the history of the U.S. Merchant Marine. It's not. There are other issues. Understand the biggest reduction for the, for the shipping of the Jones Act was the interstate highway system. As soon as you built the interstate highway system, you didn't need ships moving cargo as much anymore. As soon as you built the interstate pipeline system, you didn't need tankers anymore. Again, there are a lot of issues that contribute to the decline of the merchant marine, but this causality that it's all this one piece of legislation is wrong. It goes on here, as an immediate solution, there should be waivers for South Korea, Japan, and Greece as strong maritime allies under the Jones Act. Greece does not build that many ships. I don't know why he's throwing Greece in here. Again, the largest shipbuilders by percentage are China, South Korea, Japan, 93%. Every other country under there is less than 1%. If you add Europe together, it's about 4%. Uh, realistically, it is not possible in the short term to outperform China in the maritime sphere. No kidding. Goes on here, but the U.S. can, in coordination with its allies, alter the logistic paradigm. At a minimum, the goal should be to avoid the reoccurrence of the obviously failures of shipping supply chains during COVID-19 pandemic. I don't know about you, but I didn't see a shipping shortage during COVID. I saw 109 ships off LA and Long Beach. I don't think we had a shortage of ships. I think we had a breakdown in the logistics infrastructure in the United States in how to handle ships. If you want to know who was successful during COVID to ship, it was Matson Lines. Matson Lines, who owned their own dock, was able to bring ships in, bypass the long line off the docks, off of LA and Long Beach, come directly into their pier, offload, and provide guaranteed service for its customers, both between the United States and Hawaii, but also with their Far East service. And so they were able to do something that other people could. He then goes on, uh, the merchant marine needs to become globally competitive and it needs to innovate with new technologies. Okay, I agree. Which can happen with deregulation. This is libertarian talk. You know, the, the whole thing is deregulation. Protectionism breeds weak and uncompetitive industries while innovation and renewed competitiveness would eventually make the Jones Act unnecessary. I Again, they will use the analogy that, well, Britain repealed its, its, its cabotage. Britain repealed cabotage when its merchant marine controlled 50% of the world's ships. That's when they repealed cabotage. When, when they were the only player in town, that's when they repealed it. The U.S. has revolutionized shipping before with containerization. Uh, real quick side note there, Malcolm McLean couldn't sell containerization for anything for 10 years. Couldn't sell it. It's the Vietnam War and the U.S. government that shows that containerization has a utility to it. And by the way, when U.S. lines goes belly up in the 80s, uh, the U.S. government refuses to bail it out. It collapses to the benefit of a couple of shipping lines, not the least of which was Evergreen. And then when Sealand was in problems, the U.S. government, again, didn't help it out. And instead, it got bought up by Maersk. And so... While we have containerization to thank us, we've also seen the reduction in the number of container companies out there. 20 years ago, the top 10 companies controlled 50% of the containers afloat. Today, the top 10 control 85%.
goes on here and can do it again with modularization, which is resisted by labor unions. I don't know what he means by modularization. I don't know what he's talking about. Is he talking about the shipbuilding aspect where you build ships in modules and bring them together? That, okay, then that's an issue that we need to talk about. We need reform. But repealing the Jones, and see, if you repeal the Jones Act, that means the, the traffic on the Mississippi River is now open to foreign flag, that the Staten Island Ferry is open for foreign ownership. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about here. All right, that brings us to the last paragraph. The solution to the current predicament has already been articulated in the Heritage Foundation's special report. Regaining U.S. maritime power requires a revolution in shipping. I've read this report. The authors argue for a blue ocean strategy under which ships could, would circumvent the Jones Act by offloading cargo to ships waiting 12 nautical miles away from the U.S. shoreline. As container ships increase in size, the dated U.S. ports will struggle to cope with advanced cranes, increased depth, and offloading areas. One could thus circumvent the Jones Act by offloading 12 nautical miles from the U.S. shore. Okay, this is the Heritage Report. Regaining U.S. maritime power requires a revolution in shipping. Uh, written by Brent Sadler and Peter St. Onge. I, I, I apologize, my Canadian there is probably terrible. So uh, a paper written back in May, I re I've read this thing when it first came out and I had qualms with it in certain areas. Uh, and actually I voiced it to Brent specifically about it. Key takeaways over the past 30 years, the U.S. has gradually ceded its economic security by increasing its reliance on other nations shipping and shipbuilding. Okay, true, especially China. The U.S. must regain global competitiveness in shipping and shipbuilding while ensuring that the U.S. Navy remains a credible deterrent. Okay. Nothing short of a revolution in U.S. shipping is required to compete with China's world-class merchant fleet and its quickly expanding navy. Completely agree with those takeaways. I think they're exactly right. Where the U.S. in the past has, has excelled is during periods of technical innovation. Uh, the shift from uh, steam power to diesel, for example, the U.S. embraced that. Uh, it was great. The shift from coal to oil, the U.S. embraced uh, magnificently. And now this new inflection in power will probably be another one. So they talk about the construction of ports in the United States. So understand U.S. ports cannot handle the largest container ships in the world. The big ultra large container ships, those that carry over 20,000 containers, 20 to 24,000, cannot come into U.S. ports, largely because the U.S. doesn't have the cranes for them. Uh, we have dredged U.S. ports to handle larger container ships. So if you look at L.A. and Long Beach, uh, Savannah, and a few other ones, uh, they can handle much larger ships coming into them. We're seeing drafts down to 50 feet in many U.S. ports. Matter of fact, uh, we're seeing ports uh, really excel. This is a little bit dated because some ports are much deeper than what they have in here. So opportunities for new intermodalism with railroad and airports nearby, two dozen cities and ports on the west coast of the U.S. could provide maritime shipping destinations currently available only to much larger ports. The concept here is that container ships can stay out beyond the 12-mile limit and they can offload to all these ports. It's no longer just a handful. It's no longer just L.A. and Long Beach and Oakland and Seattle, Tacoma. Now you could bring in Oceanside and Coos Bay and Humboldt Bay and Morro Bay. And you can increase the number of containers coming ashore by multiple ports. But you may be asking yourself this question, because I asked myself this question. Wait a minute, Sal, if you're 12 miles off port, offshore, who's offloading the container? How are you getting the containers from the ship to the shore? Well, <laughs> no worries. Heritage has the solution. I'm going to go full scale here so you can bask in the glory of this graphic uh, that they have in here. So as a maritime container ships grow larger, fewer ports will be able to accommodate them. The requirements for water depth, crane size offloading areas without incurring massive construction costs. One solution is to offload the cargo without going to port. So number one, okay, I'm just going to read it for you. I just, I'm going to try to keep a straight face as I read this. Large container ship remains in international waters 12 miles offshore, and we'll assume that it's perfectly flat calm, the ship is not rocking and moving, that it's perfectly flat calm, because 12 miles offshore in the Pacific is like a pond all the time. Number two, <clears throat> cargo is transferred onto smaller ships, wait, or loaded onto vertical lift aircraft, such as helicopters, drones, or not kidding. Dirigibles. Dirigibles. Blimps. Okay. I, I, I'm going to just take a moment here and tell you something. 
In the 1960s and 70s, the U.S. government looked at offloading ships, what were called fast deployment logistics ships with helicopters. And what they found out was helicopters can't lift that much. A cargo container, a 40-foot con cargo container can carry up to 20 tons. There are very few helicopters. Stop screaming at the, at the TV now and the, and the camera and telling me, well, oh, Chinooks. And the, look them up. Look what the carrying capacity of helicopters actually are. 20 ton containers are ridiculously heavy. And the idea that you're going to lift them with helicopters or dirigibles is number one, can you do it? Yes, you can do it. There's no doubt that someone's going to come up with a dirigible or a helicopter that can do it. Matter of fact, I just saw this story today at Maritime Executive up, up and away. Airships used to fly large cargo from ships to remote areas. Uh, Louis Dreyfus Amateurs has a novel idea of how to move large cargo for shippers. They plan to fly it to and from ship using airships, not unlike blimps and dirigibles. They can carry up to 60 tons they're talking about. The thing that they're all missing is this. You have a 20,000 TEU vessel. Let's assume that it's loaded with FEU, so you're down to 10,000 FEUs. How long does it take you to move 10,000 containers by helicopter or dirigible? How many of these things do you have? Seriously, you're 12 miles offshore. How fast is your dirigible moving? How fast are you going? And I know what they're telling me. That, well, Sal, you're going to multiple ports. You won't need to offload that much. Where does the cargo go that comes into the West Coast of the United States? About two-thirds of a container ship's cargo goes east. East. It, it goes on Class 1 railway, it goes on drayage, it goes on trucks, and it goes east. That, that's not where they go. They're going to go someplace else. And now you're telling me that you're going to be able to offload this? Understand, the issue that they miss is called throughput. How much can you move? How many tons of cargo can you move? Because the thing you can't beat is a ship-to-shore crane. Ship-to-shore crane can move a container off a ship in 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Boom, container off. How fast is your dirigible going to be? If you can't move it in 30 seconds off, well, let's give you a minute. I'll give you a minute. Go max time, real extend the length down to deep in the ship. Oh, and by the way, too, how do you pick up the containers that are down deep in the ship? Uh, helicopter it works great on the top layer, but now that ship is rocking and rolling. It, it's moving. There's no way to get the containers out in a deep cell when the ship is moving. None. This is not a concept that has any commercial viability. Does it have military viability? Sure, military will buy anything. Military will buy anything. This is where the military came up with the idea of offloading large, medium-speed railroads with LCACs. The problem they came up with is like you'd need a load more than three LCACs to do that because it's going to take you weeks, weeks to do it. I don't care how fast an LCAC goes. It's going to take you weeks to do this. This is not a productive method of doing it. And it also has nothing to do with the Jones Act. Because understand, these helicopters, these dirigibles are all going to have to be built in the U.S. probably. They're all going to have to be uh, uh, meet cabotage requirements for the U.S. So they're going to have to be U.S. crews. They're going to have to be U.S. personnel, U.S. companies. The ship that's shuttling here from point A to point B, it's going to have to be Jones Act compliant to do it. And, and by the way, that ship's going to have some big-ass cranes because it's going to have to be able to reach to the very top of this ship to get those containers off. For the life of me, I don't know why. Andrew decided to go with this issue as the last thing to wrap up his article with. He ends it with a statement, given that the U.S. cannot compete in global shipping under the Jones Act, it must supplant the Jones Act fleet because it will continue to wither away as it has been for years. All right. I think this was a golden opportunity to actually have a good discourse. And I think the lack of shipping knowledge on the fact of Andrew, this is not, I'm not being mean toward Andrew at all, but Understanding how commercial shipping works, and understand this is a fundamental flaw. Most people don't understand how it works. It's a very complex subject, and not very many people inside the industry, outside the industry, communicate with each other. But this this idea of of containers and and, and offshore and, and dirigibles is is not a legitimate issue. It goes past the issue that he was making. That listen, it's more expensive to build in the U.S. What can we do to offset that? We need to fix that. Listen, the Jones Act disproportionately affects people along the coast. It does. It's not just Hawaii and, and Alaska and Puerto Rico. 
it's people along the coast. People who live on the Outer Banks in North Carolina are impacted by the Jones Act. People who live on islands are impacted by this. Uh, this is something that affects everybody. We need honest reform for the Jones Act. And a debate on this is a great idea. We need to talk about this. But what we need to do is come up with a battery of solutions or topics that we can address this in. Unfortunately, swinging toward the fence here with an idea that's going to revolutionize shipping, understand no one's going to buy into that idea. No one is. Look at the amount of containers that come in and out of ports. The whole issue here is throughput. You're looking at 20 million containers coming out of LA and Long Beach yearly. I mean, I mean that's insane amount. You're not moving them off. Uh, look at Oakland. Oakland had issues with moving containers and they couldn't get Oakland to work. And that's bringing a ship right up pier side without a problem. I mean, they've got the draft, they got the cranes, they could do all of it, but they had issues with labor. This doesn't help. This helps on maybe getting containers delivered to ports, but understand most shipping containers go into distribution sites to be unpacked and then reloaded into 45 and 53 foot trailers. They don't go in shipping containers. You don't see shipping containers usually more than 50 to 100 miles from the ports because they're unpacked, unstuffed, and then reloaded, repacked into the trailers for the long haul. And so understanding how containerization works helps this argument. And, and unfortunately, that's not what you see. I, I think John makes a good quantifiable case. He has the numbers. He supports it with data, which is, which is really, really good. I disagree that the law is perfect and doesn't need to be changed. It does need to be changed. We need to have this conversation. I wish they talked about LNG. I wish they talked about that because that's an area I think that needs a lot of discussion on. I think issues about reform of the Jones Act. Hey, let's not talk about repeal, but what would you change in the Jones Act that you can do right now? Maybe it's a change in the percentage of steel coming from the U.S. Maybe it's a change in the manufacturing of components in the interior of the U.S. Maybe it's modularity and building it, which I think Andrew was talking about, but he never quite got into. You know, the idea of maybe building components of the ships overseas and bringing them here for assembly. You know, maybe an AUKUS style deal where we're building submarines for the Australian Navy. Maybe Finland builds a f icebreaker for us and then we build them here. Something along those lines, getting the Koreans into the Philly shipyard. We already got Australia, Austal uh, involved. We got the Italians, Fincantieri up in the Great Lakes. Maybe something along those lines that we need to be talking about. I just think we need discussion and we need intelligent people with knowledge of this talking about this and not high in the sky nonsense that just sucks up air out of the room and, and really distracts from what I think is the bigger issue. I don't mean to be hard on it, I really don't. But, but it, it, it's discussions like that that come from very serious people and very well-educated people and smart people at the Heritage Foundation. That's a problem, you know, because again, commercial people will look at that and sit there and go, this, these people don't know anything about containers and, and moving cargo because that it is completely not a viable option at all, at all. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How can you do it? Well, you can help me buy my dirigible so that I can go into business offloading container ships. How do you get? In, how would you like to invest in Sal's dirigible business? Well, you can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon where you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next dirigible episode, which I don't know when it'll be coming, but I hope soon because it was a fun topic. This is Sal signing off.